talk is by Nicola, who is going to tell us about the underlying foundations of the stainless verifier. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Please start. Yes. So, um, well, first, I won't assume you know what stainless is. So, stainless is a Scala verifier that we've been working on in the lab for almost 10 years now, I guess. And it started off small, and we're, we were kind of sure what it was doing, and then we added a bunch of bells and whistles. At some point, we realized it was, we weren't actually sure we were actually verifying things. We were just saying, yes, it's fine. It's found. It works. I have those three. Uh, but uh, we yeah, it wasn't so obvious that what we were claiming was verification was actually sound. So then we uh, followed by some more and decided to build a type, a type theory for stainless and show actually the type checking process made sense and was not just random. We actually found out that lots of parts we were doing were not really, really clean and uh, correct. So this, came, this is what, uh, where system F FR came into, into play. And this one didn't work either. So what is system FR? It's uh, system F. So higher the functions with type abstractions, uh, plus R, which gives you natural numbers and a recursor. And then because we want to do Scala verification, we added some uh, typical Scala terms like lead bindings, uh, fixed point, a stuck error term, the unit term, uh, unit literal. Uh, then sub t uh, some types, because they're useful for defining data types. Um, Booleans, so typically useful. Then fold and fold to get recursive uh, types. And finally, a size term, which we use when proving termination uh, by doing induction over the size of recursive types. So we have call by value semantics, operational semantics. We define them in a small step semantics, kind of expected. If I move away from the thing. Anyway, you get the usual term of values, nothing uh, weird going on here. And then the more interesting thing is types, which you might see soon. So we have <coughs> the right screen anymore. Can we uh, mirror? Yes, is it here? Control right. Uh, nope. Nope. Let's just reopen it. So types, we have a, a type variable, the pi types, uh, type abstractions, uh, so a system F type abstraction, sigma types, uh, sum types, useful for data types, uh, unit, boolean, nats, useful. Then we have a for all type, so you can quantify over uh, values in a type, uh, existentials, refinements we use for defining uh, predicates, uh, recursive type, so this, we use this to model uh, algebraic data types, which can write in Scala and an equivalence type, and a top type, which is used for when defining uh, co-inductive functions. So to kind of define what, so we want to prove that this, uh, our system is sound, so we want to define a bunch of typing rules, and we want to say that the typing rules ensure something good. So what is good? And we define good by giving, defining logical relation on types, so we associate to every type a set of good values. And the good, so the good value associated to unit type is the unit literal, Booleans is true, false. Natural numbers are just, well, all natural numbers. Um, so a refinement type, the good values are values that are in the underlying type and for which the predicate evaluates to true. Then, and so forth for segment types. Equivalence types uh, contains only the unit literal if the two terms actually evaluate to the same value. And the top type contains all values. So actually, you have to do a bit more uh, instrumentation to get this uh, set working correctly. So it's defined by induction on the size of the, of the type, but actually because of uh, system F types and recursive types, you might actually expand the size of your type by going down into certain types. And in those cases, we use this, uh, these reducibility candidates by Girard, where you keep this context, this theta context, associated to your uh, reducibility uh, relation 
and there's a, there's a mapping from type variables to sets of values. So then the actual uh, reducibility relation or the notation of a type variable is just looking up it's looking it up inside the set of, uh, of uh, reducibility candidates. And then when you're doing an abstraction, for example, it has to hold for all possible sets of values and the recursive type it uh, is in the underlying type where the alpha binding has been replaced by the recursive type at one index lower. So that's how you make sure that your, your typing relation is terminating. So it's well formed. So based on this, we define four mutually recursive uh, judgments. We have a type, so this is just standard by directional type checking. We have a type checking judgment, which is denoted by this arrow going downwards. and you look at the shape of the type to determine what checks you have to do on the given term. Then the type inference judgment, you look at the shape of the term to decide what uh, checks we're going to do to infer, find out some type. Uh, then you have the type formation judgment, which makes sure that your types will actually make sense. You're not trying to do something like refined by error. And finally, an equivalence judgment that we use to prove uh, that terms are actually equal. And this is where we use, we provide automation where you use some solver backed by SMT solver. So it's not, we don't directly go to SMT solver, we go to some intermediate INOC solver that knows how to handle high order functions and uh, does unfolding and also have other black magic. It's kind of the black box solving for us. Um, so when you want to do this type checking, often you kind of need type annotations inside your language. And the surface syntax I showed originally, the first terms, they have basically no types annotated. So the surface syntax we actually offer that you might want, what, that is then type checked, uh, has lots of type annotations, well, has places where you can add type annotations. So for example, the recursor, you can add this, uh, this type annotation, which can, you can then use to inductively show that the recursor has indeed this uh, tau type. So here, for example, you have this, uh, the recursor rule, where you get to assume that uh, the recursive value, so S in the context here, has type tau uh, when you're proving that uh, the body has type tau for n plus 1. So the main theorem we get out of this is uh, if you manage to infer some type or to check for some type, then for all substitutions in your, uh, that are valid with respect to your typing context, your value, your term will evaluate to some value inside the right type. So we get, so actually this, this uh, property ensures termination. So if you type check the program, it terminates, ensures crash freedom. If, well, okay, it also goes with termination, I guess. If you type check the program, it won't crash, it'll terminate to some value. And you also get functional correctness because your type tau, for which you've che checked, it could specify arbitrary complicated uh, properties, which you then, once you type check, you have proved that the properties will hold. Uh, so one uh, kind of cool feature we have in our system is that usually you would define, you know, well, you would define a type theory with co-inductive and inductive types. And uh, we actually kind of didn't want to do that because we wanted to be able to write these recursive types that Scala natively supports and doesn't, def Scala doesn't define anything that looks like induct or co-induct. So we have recursive types that don't care about induction and co-induction, uh, but are still well-defined. And then by giving these the fixed point rule uh, where you can apply it to anything that has a lower index and this uh, fold rule that actually case splits. So here you see our fold rule. It has a case where you're constructing a data type where uh, the index has, is zero. And then in that case, all you need to have is a value. Uh, and if you are constructing a data type where the index is greater than zero, you have to make sure that actually the fields make sense with respect to the, the, low, the lower value. So for n minus one. Um, so, for example, this lets us uh, verify things about streams. So, this is how you would define an at stream type in a system FR. But if you're like me and you like reading system FR, this is what it looks like on the more Scala syntax. And then you could define uh, zeros with this extra n parameter, which uh, is just useful there to actually give hints to the type checker. And zeros is just the infinite stream of zeros. And you want to show that this function actually terminates, is reducible, and is, is clean, has the, has, indeed has the right type. And the way you do that is, okay, the type checker, the value of the type checker will go down into the tree a bit, and at some point it will encounter this, this fold, which is a NAT stream of this, this tuple zero and a lambda that returns the, the recursive zeros call. And then it'll case split, it'll say, okay, if n is zero, then all I have to prove is that this tuple is a value. 
And since the zeros call it under a lambda, this is basically automatically true. You just check, okay, or do, these do these things match the, gram the value grammar? And here they do. Okay, we're fine. This type checks. And in the second case, you get n greater than zero, then you have to type check inside the body of the tuple. But then you just have to check that zeros does indeed have time uh, type n minus one, uh, well, unit to stream n minus one. And this is given by uh, the type of zeros, which can inductively assume here. So we get to type check this uh, stream generator using our system without having to actually define any co-inductive uh, definitions or types. So we've uh, formalized the whole system, well, the whole system, F, uh, FR system, in COC. And it's about uh, 20,000 lines of uh, COC definitions and proof, mostly proofs. Um, it also includes lots of, so a few extra types, which I haven't shown here. Uh, and lots of uh, equivalence judgments also to make sure that what we were doing in the black box solver made sense also. So it turns out that the framework we set up with this logical relation is very easy then to extend with both new types and uh, new judgments, new rules. Um, actually, the so the rules we verified are not exactly the bidirectional type checking rules, but kind of more general rules. And the bidirectional type checking algorithm is an instantiation of these rules. So we could also you can also define more instantiation of rules for special cases, can, which can be useful, like for example, type checking a lambda to a pi type. You might not want to actually have to apply the term. You might just say, like, oh, go down into the body of the lambda and check that it makes sense. Uh, okay, now, but how does system FR fit into stainless? So stainless is this uh, giant system that uh, uses the Scala comp one of the Scala compilers, either the old one or the new one now, and then transforms this Scala source code into something that system FR understands. It does measure inference also to get so system FR can automatically pull termination without having to annotate everything on the, the Scala source level. And then uh, once it gets to system FR, it runs type checker. And every time it encounters an equality, equivalence judgment, it discharges it through using Inox, which then is backed by one of uh, three SMT solvers. Um, we've evaluated stainless, so on about 14,000 lines of Scala code. Using, so we used to use our own verification condition generator, which uh, kind of worked, and we assumed it was the ground truth, but it was not. I mean, it was not actually sound. And we've uh, reevaluated, so using the new type checker, it mostly still worked. But to add some, make some small changes because we found, also found bugs in the in the um, our benchmarks. But mostly we found bugs actually in the implementation and not in the benchmarks. So we verify, yeah, about 40,000 lines of code in about six minutes generates 6,000 verification conditions, which then go to the SMT solvers. So this includes some parallelism. It's not all uh, done sequent sequentially. Uh, benchmarks include, well, the usual you know, sorting algorithms, merge sort and search and sort and quick sort and so forth. We have uh, lazy data structures, some uh, Okazaki's book. Uh, we have some concurrent data structures also, verification, uh, well, like Scala, Scala concurrent data structures. For which we don't we model kind of so the system doesn't natively support concur uh, concurrency. We kind of model it using other other techniques. We have some proofs and number theory like uh, Godel encodings, just pure math, and uh, we wrote a bunch of monads also and monad laws, uh, which we also verified. So I have lots of time. I go to extra slides. <laughs> um, so I kind of showed you this beautiful picture of a uh, type system, which is. This is kind of how you traditionally define these recursive types. But in practice, the recursive types we defined here are not as good as you would want them to be. Because for example, we define, okay, we keep this NAT stream example, and we define map. So intuitively for me, map is a function that takes a stream n and should map it to some stream n. There's no reason that the size of the stream should decrease or it should be have fewer elements or anything like that. But if you start type checking this uh, map function, well, you'll get into this n equals zero case. And you have to prove that uh, the tuple here is a value. And to do that, you have to prove that, OK, this function applied to s.head is a value. And to do that, you have to prove that s.head is a nat. The problem is that when n equals 0, if you remember our denotation of uh, recursive types, n actually can be, so we should go back to the denotation. Well, it's far now. OK, let's go back. Here. So uh, the denotation of recursive types. Here, it says v is a so, so rec t takes some index t here, and it says that elements are uh, reducible at this recursive type if it's a value and t evaluates to zero, and then has a big or. So basically, as soon as t is zero, anything is in the in the recursive type, 
And then later on, we saw before we were trying to access s dot head, but s might not actually have a head because it could be just any arbitrary value. It could very well be unit at this point. And then you would be stuck. So actually, you can't type check uh, map to stream n to stream n in our, uh, with the current denotation. So it's not even a problem with the type system. It's a problem with the, what we defined as good values. So we kind of thought about how to get around this, and we extended our definition of, well, we actually modified slightly our definition of the recursive type. So now recursive type it has to have the shape of a fold. And uh, if t evaluates to 0, it doesn't just, uh, it's not just fine immediately. It also, v also has to be part of some base type of, uh, of, of tau. And what this base type uh, function does is it removes alpha from the type tau. And how you do that is if it's a sigma type, so if it's a pair, you typically want to maintain parts that don't have alpha as a known type. So then you recursively call the base type on both sides. If it's uh, some type, the same thing. And if it's anything else, then you widen to top. So in our previous case, if you take the base type on the stream uh, tail, the type actually becomes, no, the stream uh, uh, type, the type actually becomes a pair of nat and top, which is kind of more intuitively what I would assume a, a stream to be is something that has a real head and some arbitrary value of this tail, which I can take, but I can't apply because it might not be a function anymore. I think, yeah, I think that's it for me. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, questions? You can, you can come over. No questions uh, so far. So, while someone <laughs> warms up for a question, can you can you tell us a bit more about um, what's missing now? So, I guess you you have a subset of what you yeah. are probably aiming at. And yeah, we're missing. Prop type. We want something that's kind of like Cox prop, and we have ideas of how to do it, but uh, we're not sure we can actually mechanize the proof because it might we might become as expressive as Cox by adding this. So then we're not really sure it's verifiable anymore. I'm not actually sure what conditions we need to make it uh, sound, but that's the next step. Oh, I had a question. Yeah. <laughs> how many lines was the proof? What percent? Of the cock thing? Yeah. Oh, I think it's like 90-something uh, percent. I think uh, definitions, I assume, are about yeah, a bit more than 1,000 lines, I think. So then, yeah. OK, so if there's no question, let's, let's move forward and thank Nicola again.